primary mission of the LST is to land artillery and tanks on an enemy beach, ready to fight through enemy opposition, to carry them long distances from their home port to foreign shores. In addition, they're used as lighters to unload transports and cargo ships where no harbor facilities are available. This ship is especially built and equipped for these jobs. Doors in the bow allow a ramp to be lowered for unloading cargo directly onto the beach where with its shallow forward draft, the LST may be driven. An elevator is used in lowering deck cargo to the tank deck, which is approximately on the waterline of the ship. The ship is equipped with a stern anchor used in retracting when the ship is loaded at the beach or unloaded on the beach. The powerful winch plus reversing screws make it possible to retract from the beach. Tanks, artillery, and heavy vehicles are carried on the tank deck with direct access to the bow ramp. Light and medium weight vehicles, cargo and supplies are stowed on the main deck. The troops are billeted in compartments provided on the second deck and fed in their own mess compartments adjacent to the galley on the long haul overseas. Instructions concerning the beaching schedule have been issued by the officer in tactical command. These instructions include information on the slope of the beach, the character and contour of the bottom, tidal variations, surf conditions, and any obstructions which might be encountered. If possible, the landing should occur from one to two hours before high water slack. The chances for quick retracting are always best when the ship is beached on a rising tide. In accordance with the beaching schedule, the LST's captain issues the necessary orders for ration for disembarkation of troops and vehicles. Twelve hours before H hour, final beaching preparations are begun. All dunnage and tank showing is removed from the tank deck, leaving tanks secured by chains alone. The main deck must likewise be cleared, and the 37 ventilation intakes must be opened if they have been closed. When all these intakes have been opened, not before, the exhaust fans are started. is passed by signal to man the tanks preparatory to testing the engines. One blast on the tank alarm is the signal to man the vehicle. Each tank crew is quartered as close as possible to its vehicle, so all tanks can be manned with a minimum of confusion. on the starboard side. The port tank's crews are billeted on the port side. Each crew is drilled in advance on the route it must take to its vehicle. is stationed on the after platform of the tank deck to guard against backfires. This detail mans two carbon dioxide fire extinguishers and must have a supply of sand available. In addition, the turret gunners of the nearest tanks man the permanent carbon dioxide systems on the bulkhead. 
Only after all the fans have been running for at least five minutes and the officer of the deck has given his permission, may the engines of the tank be turned over for testing. The signal for starting the engines is given by the Army officer in command. A man has been detailed constant watch on the carbon monoxide indicator. In addition, if the concentration of carbon monoxide becomes dangerous, the howler automatically gives warning and all engines must be stopped. Meanwhile, the traffic control system is tested. There are three sets of traffic lights, forward, amidships, and aft, allowing for independent control of the different sections of tanks. When all tests have been completed, the order is given to cut the engine and the soldiers secure to their quarters. report is made to the con that the tanks are secured. The ventilators are allowed to run until all exhaust has been cleared. The fan switches are cut. The ventilator is secured and report is made to the con. On nearing enemy territory, the ship goes to general quarters. The gunnery officer is with the captain at the con. The executive officer is in the chart room. The guns are manned and ready for enemy aircraft or submarine attack. The engineering officer is in charge of both the main and the auxiliary engine room. The first lieutenant has charge of the damage control party stationed aft, forward, and in the decontamination room. These parties are fully equipped with all types of tools, gear for decontaminating gas personnel or compartments, rescue breathing apparatus, and asbestos suits. While the shorters, all troops must lay below in their compartments. For stability at sea, the ship has been ballasted to ocean-going conditions, drawing about 14 feet aft and eight feet forward. Now, before beaching is attempted, she must be lightened and her trim adapted to the slope of the beach. At least three hours before each hour, the order is given to trim ship for beaching. This is done primarily with 16 interconnected ballast tanks ranged throughout the ship. This diagram indicates the change in draft and trim caused by each tank. Two 1,500 gallon per minute pumps located in the auxiliary engine room are used to shift the ballast. These banks of stop valves grouped in dual and triple manifolds permit tanks to be controlled separately. Numicator gauges indicate the amount of ballast in each tank. This valve controls the three forward tanks as a unit. Additional valves in the bilge drainage room must be used to control them separately. The three forward tanks are primarily used to trim ship to meet draft conditions required for any particular beaching. As the ballast is shifted, the ship changes draft until she reaches beaching trim, nine to 10 feet aft, three to five feet forward, these being the most ideal draft conditions. Draft required for and aft depends on weight of cargo and slope of beach. However, to attain this ideal trim, fresh water cannot exceed 40 tons or fuel exceed 10 days supply for cruising at standard speed. When the engineering officer reports ship at beaching trim, the captain orders complete preparations for beaching. The third of the three auxiliary diesels is warmed up to assure a full supply of electric power for the door, ramp, and winch motors. The assistant first lieutenant and two men of the undogging detail prepare to undog the bow doors. Access to the doors is through a manhole under the 40 millimeter gun mount. Ladders are mounted on the inner sides of the doors. The first step is casting loose the preventer I-beam. 
This is done by the first two men to enter the bow door, while the last man in starts undogging the top dog, taking an equal strain off each dog to prevent buckling. center eye beam is secured at its free end to the pad eye. The turn buckle on each dog is loosened, the dog cast loose, and the free dog is kept from swinging by a holding clip mounted on the door. Meanwhile, the ship fitter and three men of the undogging detail have been undogging the ramp. These turn buckles and dogs are similar in operation to those on the bow doors. Only the four corner dogs are left secured. When all but these four dogs have been cleared, the leading man reports to ramp control and it is relayed to the con. step in undogging the bow doors is casting loose the pelican hook of the upper preventer. The access ladder is counterbalanced to swing up out of the way of the ramp. When the doors are clear, a report is made to the con. The report, door undogged and free, is relayed to bow and ramp control. Power is now given for all generators to be cut in to supply power to all beaching machinery. The ventilators are given a final check. The fire watch is again posted. The operation of the door and ramp motor is tested and reported to the con. Thirty minutes before the time set for beaching, the order is given to sound the beaching alarm. The ship goes from general quarters to condition one Mike, beaching station. The first lieutenant comes forward to take charge of bow door and ramp control. The ventilators are started. and their tanks. And the fire watch stands by as the motors are started and warmed up. The lashing chains are cast loose and the treads blocked.
top side, the lashing chains are also removed. The extra gasoline drums are jettisoned. The elevator winch cover is also removed and the clutch engaged for elevator operation. The anchor must be readied in advance for letting go as soon as the command is given. The wire securing straps are removed. The power is checked. The winch and its controls are tested to check their operation. The anchor cable is a 900 foot wire hawser marked every 100 feet. 20 minutes before the beach will be hit, the order is given to prepare to open doors and lower ramps. A quartermaster is stationed forward to take soundings with a specially rigged line marked every foot. The soundings enable the navigator to check the charted soundings. When the ship is a half mile from the beach, the sanitary system is cut off. When the corner ramp dogs are cast free, the leading man signals ramp control by holding his arms over his head. Permission is requested of Khan to test the ramp. The motor is started, and the ramp opens slightly. To save time in combat, the motor is unclutched and the ramp put on the brake. This way, the ramp can be lowered in 20 seconds. All stations for beaching now report manned and ready. The type of beach determines the beach approach speed. In this instance, full speed ahead. Just before reaching line of departure, the command is given, open bow doors. The door with the lip is always started first. reported to the con. The command is then given lower ramp, and the ramp is lowered to about six feet above water line. anchor is let go when the ship is about two and a half lengths from the beach. One method for judging this distance is to line up the beach line with a predetermined point on the forecastle. Word is passed to let go stern anchor. The clutch brake is released by turning the compressor hand wheel to the left. The remote control lever is swung to the fast stick out position and the anchor let go. As soon as the anchor has grounded, the winch is permitted to run free. The cable is prevented from slackening excessively by adjusting the speed of the winch payout to the speed of the ship. A report is made as each 100-foot mark passes the chart. The anchor must not be let go too far from the beach, or the bitter end will break loose and anchor and cable will be lost.
As soon as the beach has been fairly hidden, the order is given to drop the ramp. When ramp has been lowered, the con is signaled from forecastle by raising arms and dropping them. The order is then given to disembark. The traffic light turns to green and the tanks move out quickly. About one minute has passed since the stern anchor was let go. be held at right angles to the beach throughout the unloading. This prevents broaching, swinging parallel to the beach, in spite of wind, surf, and tide, and also protects disembarking vehicles from the surf. Rudder, engine, stern winch are all used to hold the ship at the proper angle. Unloading progresses, the ship grows lighter. Ballast must be added forward to keep the bow fast on the beach. The engines are kept driving forward. The stern anchor is slacked off so the ship can be constantly driven into the sand. Enough tension is maintained on the cable to keep the stern from swinging. When the last tank has disembarked, the report, tank deck clear, is made to con. The order for unloading the main deck is signaled by holding both arms over the head. The elevator pins are removed from their sockets, releasing the elevator from its housing. The elevator guides, stowed along the overhead of the tank deck, must be shipped before the elevator can be operated. than a half minute of time should elapse between the exit of the last tank from below and the first vehicle from topside. Vehicles on the main deck are jockeyed into position on the elevator. guide is stationed where he can watch the elevator and signal directions to the operator.
vehicle has been unloaded from the LST, our ship has successfully fulfilled her primary mission, the landing of a force of fully manned and equipped vehicles on enemy shore. 